basically we do very short term arima forecast for each state every day what what we do is so think of maharashtra what we'll do for maharashtra is generate 1000 bootstrap samples time series for maharashtra every day to each of these bootstrap samples we will fit about 15 to 20 different arima models find the one which fits the best for each replication generate one two and three day ahead forecast for each of these replication and then average out these forecast so we are generating about 1000 forecasts from about 10 to 12000 models every day for a one state right so basically uh, it gives us fairly accurate forecast we go on to the next line so these are for example forecast we had day be day before right so on the x y axis is the actual day x on the on the x axis you have the forecasted values on the x axis is the forecasted values uh the correlation between actual values and forecasted values these are purely out of sample forecast is 0.97 so we get highly accurate forecast from this bootstrapping kind of a method uh the red line shows the relation between actual and the and the forecast right you see maharashtra at the top here which is a very large blue blob uh you know uh, which is fitting on the line then you see another mob here tamil nadu gujarat and so large collection of states at the bottom right which are all states which are going to have a large number of a small number of cases tomorrow these are all forecasts of the new cases tomorrow right so you see most of them are clustered at the end right and the, and the, at, the, at the at the at the near the origin so basically the major problems in the country at the moment are what's happening Hello, sir. We are we are losing your audio. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Hello. You're not. Can you? Uh, yeah, yeah. We can hear you now. you can hear so basically yeah. the important point that i was making is if you look at this line so basically your maharashtra tamil nadu gujarat in maharashtra it's mumbai and the mumbai metropolitan region really tamil nadu is chennai and gujarat it's amdavad amdavad surat one or two so basically it's just a handful of cities and delhi which is driving the entire corona apparatus in the in the country and that's one of the strengths because now we have corona infections which are localized they can be localized within these cities by actually locking these cities down completely it would have been a different ball game if the corona infections had spread all over the country that's one of my worries with the migrant laborers returning because what the migrant laborers are going to do is they're going to go back to small villages in interior of bihar going to small villages in interior of up jharkhand and that's where we are really badly equipped to look at uh, i know to to monitor infections to manage infections we don't have ventilators we don't have tests right so that could be a, a major game changing kind of a situation in addition to that human tragedy of people walking miles and miles and miles with uh, babies and and thing and and you know they're all belonging Hello, so we are losing your audio again. We can't hear you actually for last twenty odd seconds. Hello. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. We can hear you now. Yes. Go, go to the next slide. Okay. Just a second. Okay. Yeah. So second slide tells you what's going to happen tomorrow. So you see that triangles are tomorrow's forecast. The blobs are today's values. So today's these are today's values. You see, Maharashtra is going to see an increase. 
Tamil Nadu is actually going to see a decline. Gujarat will see an increase and Delhi will see a big jump. Rest of the states and probably MP is going to see a jump. But rest of the states are again going to be fairly clustered around only have some very small increases. So that brings me back to my original point is Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat. So basically Gujarat, Delhi, Maharashtra which need to be monitored a certain number of and so, so basically it's, it's Corona in Maharashtra in India is now a game of actually managing a small number of big cities. Right? Yeah. So, so, so basically what we then do here is, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we were sort of what we did was in the what came in the media last time was <laughs> that we actually estimated carrying capacities for a large number of states and depending on doubling rates we said how long will it take to approach those carrying capacities and we I think we're fairly right in the case of Kerala we're fairly right in the case of Himachal Pradesh we're fairly right in the case of Telangana uh, but uh, Tamil Nadu for example Haryana suddenly showed large spikes and then we are in the process of revising our uh, forecasts for Maharashtra, we think that our carrying capacity is about 37 to 38,000 cases uh, and we are currently about 15,000, a doubling rate of about 12, 12, 12 days. We should be able to get there in about 15 to 20 days. So by the end of May, uh, we should be able to get things under control in uh, Maharashtra as well. Right. So, 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 so the learnings from all this is that I think Corona infections in India are not running out of hand, except for a few states, right? Uh, they are uh, basically everywhere you see the worm is less than one, doubling rates are going up, but typically the worm is less than one. It's certain cities like Mumbai, Ahmedabad, Chennai, one or two other uh, cities, uh, Agra, which need to be really uh, looked after. And if those cities are looked after well, uh, without uh, you know changing the rules of the game in any way by letting people move across the country, uh, changing the entire dynamics of the disease, uh, it's I think we should be home uh, by you know by by soon. And when I say we should be home by soon, it doesn't mean that we we'll get rid of corona. Coronavirus will always be there, but it'll probably stay as a localized infection like tuberculosis or measles, influenza. We get periodic uh, bouts of influenza even now. We get periodic bouts of measles. So those kinds of periodic bouts will be there. All of us will have to be very careful in the future. But at least the rate at which new cases are coming up and the burden on the on the healthcare system, uh, etc., will uh, probably not be there uh, by the end of May if these cities are handled well and nothing is done to change the rules of the game. So that is what I wanted to say, uh, Sandeep. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to talk to everybody. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, sir. So we will be taking up questions. Uh, you may write your questions in the chat box to me. So I will try and take up uh, the questions one after another. Uh, one of the questions that uh, somebody has asked you already was about the software that you have been using. So can you let us know which software that you have been using? It's a free open source R. R. So we do everything in R and in, including the data visualization, everything is done in R. So we don't use anything else. The data that we use are all publicly available. So for India, for example, if you go to my, that Arogya Setu app by the government and you get statewide data every day. For We do this same exercise for all the countries in the world also every day. So every day we do I think 15-20 hours of data crunching. So that, that data we get from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, we also do other things like R. With R, what we can also do is R can actually go to a website, download data, run all these models, uh, calculate variables, put them onto a map. So in the university, if you go to the university website, you will see uh, maps of the world with uh, you know uh, forecasts of the entire region around the world, which can be done by R. I'll be happy to share all the codes if somebody is interested. Yeah, actually, there was one question. Uh, people have been asking your presentation and the documents that you have shared earlier, the papers that you have shared earlier with us. Uh, so, the data and the code that we're very happy to send. Sure, sir. We'll be able to share with all of them. Yeah. So I'll take the next question, uh, which has been asked by Pabitra Jena. Uh, she's asking how to estimate switching period. Uh, Pavitra, switching period would mean that uh, delta xt by delta xt minus 1. So, Pavitra, delta xt is r delta xt minus 1 et. It's the first order air process. So, what we do is, 
because we can't use the entire time series uh, from day one to say the next 30 or 30 or 40 days because uh, you know the entire time series would have r changing across so you reshape they have an r less than one they have an x we have a x you have a period where r is greater than one you can have a period with r less than one so basically what we do is we only use the last 15 days so we are estimating r for april 15 we take data from april 1 to april 15 generate 1000 bootstraps of that for each bootstrap estimate an ar1 coefficient and average those ar1 coefficients out and look at and also create the standard errors of that right so we bootstrap actually every day 1000 such models and calculate ar1 so next day on the 16th of april we'll calculate again we'll take the data from first second of april to the 16th of april again generate 1000 replications for each day for each of these replications estimate an ar1 coefficient average across all those air one coefficients and take the mean value and call that the estimated r for that period also for that mean value all that all the 1000 ar also find out the lower two and a half percent upper 97.5 percent quantiles and keep on doing this every day right so the next question is from rajesh yeah. he's asking ai ms aims i had mentioned that the peak will happen in june july but your research shows gradual tapering so what is your take on this? See, I am a bit skeptical about these SIR models. You know, all these people are using those. Doctors are always, always taught as a part of their course that those SIR models, susceptible. So what do they do? They assume a closed society. Hello? Hello, yes sir. Can you hear me? Audible, audible. Yeah. Basically what they do is, they say that, okay, at any point of time, total in population in a country are either susceptible or infected or recovered. Right? Then they say, then they actually work out differential equations in time and then they work out the dynamics based on certain assumptions. Now, you see, this is good for, say, measles or influenza where the game doesn't change. Whereas something as large as COVID, you see, when COVID happens, governments take action, people's behavior changes. So it becomes very, very hard to predict something one month ahead or two months ahead in advance. I think you should not do that. Right? It's like, as I said, uh, SIR models the models which would actually try to create a mathematical model for a cricket match and say at the beginning of the match, before the match begins or just when the match has begun, what will happen in the 10th over, what will happen in the 20th over, what will happen in the 37th over and ultimately what will be the end of the game. You can do that if it's a very simple game. But in a game of cricket, you know, there are lots of you know, things which you can't predict beforehand, lots of things you can't model. And therefore, if you are actually playing a game, you are actually saying what is going to forecast of what's happening to a cricket match, you like to go by ball by ball, right? You will say, okay, first over, first ball of the 31st over I've seen, I can then say something about what will happen to the second ball. Once I've seen the second ball, I can say something that will happen to the third, fourth, the fifth ball really. Nothing much beyond that, right? So, so I think that's the way we have to go on this. You have to take it at a ball at a point, right? And that's what these sir models don't do. They assume that uh, the structure doesn't change. People don't change. People's behavior doesn't change. Government policy doesn't change. And therefore, they give, often they give highly exaggerated values. For example, the Johns Hopkins University had said, and it's not really Johns Hopkins University Center for Disease Dynamics and Economic Policy, put out some forecasts at the beginning of, uh, at, the, at the end of March, which said that about in Maharashtra alone, two crore people would have been infected by beginning of May. We have got nothing like that. Right? We have got nothing, really nothing like that. Or, uh, you know, for cow, uh, mad cow disease, for example, uh, models in the United States said that there will be something like 65,000 deaths in the US, which led to a culling of a lot of cows. But actually, the number that died was only 475. Right? So, these SIR models can go very wrong. And therefore, I think, as anybody, as, 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 as somebody who's used to forecasting how people behave econometrically, I think we can't really forecast more than two or three very short time periods uh, in advance and then learn from that and go ahead and forecast another two, three days. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think all these AIMS model, mathematical models of disease dynamics should be taken with a pinch of salt. Right. Yeah. Uh, so next question is by Ms. Jayanti Behra. She's asking, can we use a Stata software for the estimation? I don't know, Jayanti, because, uh, you know, uh, this, for example, the bootstrapping algorithms that are available in R data visualize also available in R. 
or is a free open source software but i'm sure stata would have something like a uh, boot uh, a maximum entropy if 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 stata is maximum entropy bootstrap estimators uh, which have been developed by professor vinod something to do that then everything else should probably be doable in stata that's not very difficult right next question is from dr sunil mosley uh, is asking what is impact of labor migration on covid 19 is the yeah, yeah. so it is largely the strength of india is that covid migration the covid infection the concentrated what are the problem states delhi gujarat maharashtra tamil nadu they are all concentrated in a few metropolitan regions or city so delhi Mumbai metropolitan region, Chennai, Ahmedabad, Surat. So these, as long as we can localize them, as long as we can localize them geographically, they'll be easier to control. But if you allow workers to move out, and if they, for example, infection spread to say villages in Bihar, or villages in UK, villages in Jharkhand, where we are not equipped. When there are no infections outside Mumbai, you open that out a little bit even more. But you don't allow any inside-outside movements from in. So it's like a kind of a chakra view, you know. So you have the inside area, so you have an inside perimeter wall for the most infected area. Then you have an outside wall for areas which are not infected so much. You have an even bigger outside wall for areas which are even less infected. And you have containment within each of these uh, uh, these areas, but these areas will become successively bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and uh, the economic losses because the area over which economic activity will take place will keep on becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, you will actually be able to, uh, you know, the economic losses will uh, go down. So I think we have to down do very focused containment strategy. And this whole nationwide lockdown, we, it has to now. It can't. Uh, but but the other part is before we close the before we leave the lockdown, we have to also do a lot of micro planning. So, for example, if you are going to leave the lockdown in Mumbai, then you got workers going to travel from. Take up the next question, uh, which asked, which has been asked by Meera Malikaukar. She's asking, given the forecast models are inflated, do you think same thing is happening with climate change modeling? I have no idea, Meera. I have really no idea. I'm not an expert on climate change, uh, but uh, so really, I won't be able to tell you about that. Right. So. So we are having a very uh, time for uh, a couple of questions only. Uh, so I'll take up the next question, which has been asked by Munesh Kumar. Uh, shouldn't we or our government analysis the Kerala model and try to implement it in other states also? So what is asking that should we implement Kerala model all across India? Would be your take? Yeah, Kerala model has a history to it. I mean, Kerala has had a government which has consistently invested on health infrastructure. You can't do that overnight in a country, in any other state. So it's a lesson that we have to pay more attention to your public health. Not only public health, but I think what is also more important is you see where are the where are the infections? Infections are happening in slums in Mumbai, slums in Chennai, where a lot of our labor stays. So we are running our cities on the backs of unpaid labor workers who live in poor, very poor conditions. What we call the so-called service sector in the urban areas, where are and uh, I think uh, that kind of a model will not be sustainable anymore uh, because this was this is a time bomb which was anyway going to happen. In the slums in Mumbai, slums in Chennai, slums in Ahmedabad uh, were anyway sitting on a kind of a volcano with some infection uh, uh, to sort of set them off. 
and we have this new coronavirus infection which was the right thing and you know, which which has ignited those volcanoes so i think we'll have to look at how we house people what is the kind of a structure on which our city what is the kind of an economy that we want to have in our cities how do we make sure that people who work for us work for our cities uh, you know stay in decent conditions have decent health and so on and that's going to be a very important challenge for the next yeah uh, one more question from my side sir uh, what would be your uh, the, the university of oxford has developed one uh, stringency indicator so yeah. Uh, what would be your take on this and in, in uh, reference to that uh, has our lockdown in india has it been successful enough which has been so, so what we did was sadip did a study mm -hmm. we looked at countries which had reached 100 uh, you know uh, stringency right and then we looked at how their infection that proceeded after reaching 100 mm -hmm. right so uh, you know how long did it take for them to sort of get things under control and the important lesson for that was that the the lockdown is not sufficient right what really what it depends on is how effective your governments are right so typically say, the, the governments like so countries like new zealand which are small mm -hmm. which are rich right and which have high degrees of government effectiveness the world bank measures the the, the degree of government in the effective governance it has actually as a ranking system right so 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 countries like israel countries like new zealand could actually bring their infections quickly under control countries like india and pakistan took longer right took longer to sort of uh, you know uh, get things under order and have not really been able to bring do as well as these countries and then the other countries who have imposed lockdown like zimbabwe and syria which are no effective governments and the lockdown has not mattered at all so it's not just the lockdown but it's also the effectiveness with which you implement the lockdown the ability to to see to it that the lockdown is actually implemented right is also very important variable uh, and i think in indian case uh, we have been able to flatten the, we have been able to slow down infections that's right but we have not been able to do something like new zealand did. it actually is almost on the verge of getting rid of the infection right the virus is going away from new zealand Uh, so that is not uh, that kind of a success we have not had we have been better than syria and zimbabwe that's what i can say but that's not saying much really right uh, one more question regarding one of the studies i believe they have done it in ipfp yes. they have been correlating the spread of covid 19 uh, uh, with the, uh, as compared to cities they are comparing city wise uh, how it has been spreading across so do you see that uh, any evidence of previous for that Yeah, because you see, cities are. I mean, it's. Uh, yeah, I come again. I didn't get your question fully. So I think uh, I got it. There is one yeah. study. Uh, they have been correlating the spread uh, across the cities. They are uh, comparing the cities in India, especially in Maharashtra. And what the study says that uh, the metro, the most of the uh, metros are getting affected. So, do you see any evidence for that while uh, doing your study? hello am i audible i think we lost your audio hello hello yes and yes, sir Thanks for pointing it out. Yeah, I have not seen that study. I never look at that, and then maybe I can talk to you. Okay. So last question, sir. Uh, uh, it is about what about other variables like family size on spread of COVID, asked by Pramod Lonarkar. No, you see, we actually did again some study where we looked at the relationship between age composition. So, so we did a kind of an aggregative study across countries in the world. Mm -hmm. and we found that what what mattered was to three or four variables one of course what was the age structure of population so populations where there are a lot of older people or actually you had a greater spread of uh, covid you also had richer countries having greater spread of covid we also found that countries which had a larger number of air travelers had a larger spread of covid uh, we found that countries where uh you know population density was high did not necessarily have greater uh, amount of uh, spread of covid uh, and finally we found that countries were more open in terms of trade actually had less spread of covid 
right? Interestingly, countries which had larger share of merchandise trade to their GDP last year, uh, to uh, you can't do it for this year. Last year, uh, actually had a lower uh, spread of COVID. Uh, family sizes, we don't know because we don't have the family level data. Uh, but other demographic characteristics, yes, uh, older populations mean larger COVIDs. And uh, if older populations, if larger families also mean older populations are staying, older people are staying with the family, uh, then that would also probably mean uh, larger infections. Right. So we have been getting messages uh, congratulating your study from Dr. Apala Naidu. And on that note, sir, I would like to close the session. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, 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 thank you to Ms. Pallavi Belikar also. And I think it has been a wonderful study. Uh, I, uh, we would be able to share all of your paper. We would be able to see all of your paper, complete paper. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. In somewhere. So everybody can read it and understand it in a better way. Sure. Sure. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so, everybody. Thank you very much for your time, sir. Thank you, all the participants, for joining in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.